Good morning, church. Would you just stand with me as we as we begin singing? God so loved the God so loved the world.
be seated. In Christ alone we have everything. And out of what God has given to us, we give just a little bit back to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful means hilarious, one who is thrilled to give. So it's not a sense of, I have to give, it's, I get to give to God through a church for His kingdom. And so as we call the, uh, those, you can come forward and to take up the offering. We recognize some give this way, some give through uh, electronic means, but just as we take these few minutes, do so as an act of worship to the Lord, recognizing that all comes from Him. And if you're a guest today, you do not have to feel obligated to give. But if you do, we do welcome it as a gift to the Lord's work here. And so as you take the offering, then you'll come back to the front for prayer. towards the work of your kingdom. And may you cause the seeds to grow into uh, more blessings. And Lord, we pray that you will bless us and keep us, make your face shine upon us, turn your face towards us and give us your peace. And we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. think so? Well, are you happy to be in church this morning? Yeah. Amen. What a beautiful morning out there, and a uh, fine crowd in here, I must say, so I'm very, uh, very glad to be here this morning. We just have a couple of announcements. Uh, before we jump into them, I want to mention, my name is Pastor Dan. I'm the associate pastor here at Cornerbrook Baptist. If you're visiting with us, if this is your first time or uh, you haven't been uh, attending in a while, um, I just want to uh, extend a very warm welcome to you. We hope that you enjoy your morning uh, worshiping with us. We would love to have your contact information. And so uh, out in the foyer, there's just some little cards. Uh, just give us a little bit of your information so we can keep in contact and, and uh, just have a record that you were here. All right, I just have a couple of announcements before we go into our prayer time. Um, there are uh, a few things I wanted to, uh, wanted to mention. Uh, we are hiring. You'll see in your bulletin. We're looking for an individual uh, or couple who will clean the church weekly um, 
For more details, contact Pastor Mitchell. So it is a paid position. If you would uh, like to take that on and be uh, you or you and another person would like to clean the church, we would, uh, we would be interested in chatting with you. Also, Nancy mentioned to me that out in the foyer, there are some trees. Hold that up there, uh, Cheryl. I forgot to bring it up with me. There's some trees. If you take them and plant them in a few years, I mean, you've got firewood, maybe. <laughs> but uh, she had some left over from school, so uh, if you would like to take one of those and, uh, and plant them in your garden or, or around your house, uh, you can do that. Um, also, we have uh, on Wednesdays in the month of June, from 7.30 to 8.30, we've got a prayer group happening here. We had one last week, and it was fantastic. We would love for you to come and, uh, and join us. And uh, we spend some time praying, and then we've got a, uh, we've got a video that we, we watch to end the night. So come and join us on Wednesdays. I have one other announcement. Next week, anybody know what the big day next week is? Next Sunday? F- oh, come on. All the men are going, please, I hope they remember. <laughs> Father's Day. Exactly. You wouldn't forget Mother's Day, would you guys? But... Uh, Anyway, next week is Mother's Day, and so after the service today, we want to do just a Father's Day. Come on. Listen to what I mean, not what I say. Um, Next week is Father's Day, and we would like to put together just a short video um, for, for next week, for next Sunday morning. And what I would like to do is if you're here with your father whether you are a, 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 a kid or you're a, an adult and your father is here with you, we would like five or six uh, either sons and daughters with their father. To after, so after the service, uh, it'll take maybe 20 minutes or a half hour to get it done. We would just love for you to stick around for a little bit. We're going to film, uh, uh, film a video. So if you're here with your father, we would love, to, uh, love for you to be a part of that. So kid or adult. Julia, it would be great for you and Paul to stick around. I think that would be wonderful. All right. Uh, let's, um, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we're going to take a few minutes to, uh, to pray.
scripture reading this morning is in Mark chapter 7. Is this my lapel mic on? Mark chapter 7. Um, The last two summers, we've been going through the book of Mark. So the first year I was here, we, I don't know, got to chapter 5 or 4 or 5. And then last year, through the summer, we finished off uh, chapter 7, verse 23. I didn't have to tell you. I knew you knew that anyway. I know. So this year we are picking up for the summer. We're starting this morning. Mark chapter 7, verse 24. And we're reading the rest of Mark chapter 7. So it says here, Jesus left the place, left that place, and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre. And went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There, some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, and his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about him, about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So this time we'll have the kids and the youth be dismissed to head downstairs. So in this section of Mark... I'm calling it The Outsiders. What you see there on a screen is a book, a picture of the cover of a book written by a pastor named Roy Ratcliffe. And in this book, he writes about his ministry to Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was convicted for crimes of murder, dismemberment, and cannibalism. And Ratcliffe, a local pastor, received a call one day that a man at a nearby prison wanted to be baptized. And Ratcliffe eventually baptized Dahmer and met with him for one hour each week. And in this book, he responds to questions about whether God could save or even love such a man. One of the members of Roy's church actually said, If Jeffrey Dahmer is going to heaven, then I don't want to be there. And in this book, he responds, how can a Christian hold that viewpoint? I don't understand it. Is forgiveness limited to those who are not very bad at all? Is there no joy in knowing that a sinner has turned to God? Can we in the church identify those who we see as worthy and on the inside? And do we ever see anybody beyond the grace of God and the outsiders? 
how, would, how does God want us to respond to this, this kind of a story here? Well, I think some of that we can see in this story of Jesus before us. Jesus is the Savior who cannot be hidden. So in this story, the first story about Jesus and his interaction with the lady, I want to note four surprises. Okay? Surprise number one is that Jesus would go to this area at all. Now, it's interesting when this story happens. In the story previous to this, Jesus had just been debating with the Pharisees about what makes a person clean or unclean. And Jesus said, it's not what you do on the outside, eating with unwashed hands or having a dirty dish. That's not what makes you unclean. What makes you unclean comes from within, from the heart. And then, I don't think it's a coincidence that immediately after that confrontation about what is clean and unclean, Jesus heads into Gentile area. Jesus goes into an area that the Jewish people would consider unclean. Because this is the area of Tyre. And as far as we can tell, this is the only time Jesus went beyond the borders of Israel. This area had a long history of opposition to Israel. This was the home of Jezebel, both Ezekiel, Zechariah prophesied against this area. The Old Testament depicted Tyre as a wealthy and godless oppressor. There was a brief period of time under King David where they got along. Other than that, the area of Tyre was known for its oppression and hatred for Israel. The city was considered by the Jewish people defiled and unclean. The, the Jewish historian Josephus wrote that the people of Tyre are our bitterest enemies. So not just enemies, these are arch enemies. And the Jewish people, it would be hard for them to grasp the idea that God's salvation would even extend to this area. And so this is surprise number one, that Jesus would go in to this non-Jewish territory. Surprise number two is the fact that this woman would come to Jesus. Word gets out that Jesus is in the house, and she shows up asking for help. She's a woman. She's a Gentile. She's Syrophoenician by birth. She probably knew it was socially unacceptable for her to approach a Jewish rabbi on any level, but her daughter is suffering. She falls at the feet of Jesus, she pays her respect to Jesus, and she intensely pleads. Jesus is her last hope to rescue her little girl. And, and the Greek there implies she kept on asking. She kept on begging Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. She's bold, she's humble, she's persistent. She's not going to take no for an answer. And notice she calls him Lord. Matthew tells the story also. In that story, she calls him Son of David. It's interesting that in the story previous, the Jewish leaders did not recognize Jesus as Lord, and they're the ones that should have. In this story, she recognizes him as Lord, and it wouldn't be... It's unexpected for her to do that. And we find that in the book of Mark. The ones we expect to re reject Jesus are the ones who actually recognize him for who he is. So in other, in other words, Mark is telling us the expected don't make it, the unacceptable do. Same thing today. Sometimes the hardest people to reach with the gospel are those who see themselves as just good people. They make statements like, well, I'm just as good as the people down at the church. What do I need Jesus for? Sometimes those who are brought up in the church never personally trusted Jesus. And they never see Jesus for who he truly is. So surprise number two, that this woman would come to Jesus at all. 
Then we have surprise number three. When it comes up, there we go. Surprise number three, that Jesus would dismiss her so sharply. The reaction of Jesus is kind of strange. He doesn't answer her right away. He lets her keep on asking. And then when he finally responds, his response is shocking. It's controversial. It's, a, it's scandalous. He says, first, let the children eat all they want. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Why is he so rude when she is just pleading for her daughter? I mean, hey, we don't care if Jesus is rude to those stuck-up religious leaders. I mean, let them have it. But here's a mom pleading for her daughter. How can he be so callous? I mean, to call someone a dog was offensive in that culture. They had a totally different view of dogs than we do. There were the rare times in that culture when dogs were associated with positive virtues, such as service or watchfulness. But almost all, almost every Old Testament passage shows the contempt that the Israelites had for dogs. Dogs were scavengers. They would eat garbage. They would eat dead animals and even corpses. The rabbis considered the Gentiles as dogs because they were ignorant, godless, pagan. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, do not give what is holy to the dogs. He uses dogs as a figure of speech for those who willfully walk away from the gospel. Why would Jesus speak this way? Well, several explanations have been given. One explanation is that Jesus is speaking harshly to see how she would react. She calls him Lord. Does she really believe it? In other words, they, they say that Jesus temporarily withholds his help in order to test her faith, to stretch her faith. My, it's possible. My question would be is, if this is a test of faith, Jesus does not congratulate her for passing it. What would have happened if she had failed the test? We don't know. So possible it's a test of faith for her. A second explanation is that Jesus says what the woman expects from a Jewish rabbi. But he does so kind of with a twinkle in his eye, you could say, and in a, in more, in a more playful manner, which would ease the tension. Because in proponents of this view say that the word dog is not the usual word for dog in Greek. It's a word that would correspond to our word for puppy. It's not a street scavenger. It's a household pet. Because some of the Jewish families did have little dogs as household pets. These pets tended to go under the table at mealtimes. And they were fed table scraps after the family had eaten. You, have, you know what happens? Anybody have a dog? And you know what happens when you start feeding them from the table? Yeah, like dogs learn pretty quick. They know where the... They, they know where the next bite is coming from, right? But, so, this, so proponents of this view say that this is how Jesus is saying. He's using the word poppy, and it's kind of in a more playful manner. Possible. It's, likely, it's very possible that Jesus is using it in this way. Even so, the, even so this word poppy or a dog is not really a term of endearment. Another explanation is that Jesus is directing his comments more at the disciples than at the woman. In Matthew's account, there's some more details. In Matthew's account, the lady comes to Jesus, and Jesus' disciples say to Jesus, Jesus, she's bothering us. Send her away. She keeps pestering us. We came here, we came north for a little rest and relaxation, and she's intruding on our vacation time. You need to send her away. And so Jesus says, all right, guys, you want me to send her away? Listen to what that sounds like. So then he turns to her and says, 
It's not right to take bread from the children and toss it to the dogs. In other words, Jesus is trying to say to them, you see how hard and callous and unloving you are when you should be gracious? You know, Jesus wants, Jesus is trying to teach them to have compassion towards all people, including this Gentile woman. Jesus is, now all those are, I think, very good explanations. I, some say it's probably a combination of all of them. But one thing we can say for sure is that Jesus is deliberately scandalous. You ever notice how Jesus throws stumbling blocks in front of people? He confronts the Pharisees by calling them hypocrites. He insults this Gentile woman. What if we allow, instead of trying to figure out exactly what's going on, what if we just simply allowed the scandal to stand as it is? What if we just let it be scandalous? We should ask ourselves, if this story offends us, why? How would we have responded? And what if this story is intended to be scandalous in order to help us look into our own hearts? Because here's the thing. The real Jesus is always offensive in some way. We look at this story and we might say, well, if that's the way he feels, I'll never come to him for help. Pride kicks in and keeps us from going beyond the scandal. And we turn to gods of our own making instead of Jesus. You see, we can convince ourselves that we are special and worthy of God's grace instead of seeing this woman as truly desperate and doing anything that it will take to come to Jesus. She's the model for us. So surprise number three, that Jesus would dismiss her so sharply. And, and here's the ultimate surprise, number four, that the woman actually accepts the premise of Jesus. It would have been easy for her to say, well, this is scandalous. This is offensive. I'm going to walk away. Yet she fires back with a burst of boldness. Tim Keller once said, there are cowards and there are regular people. There are heroes and then there are parents. P parents are not, he writes, parents are not really on the spectrum from cowardice to courage. Because if your child is in jeopardy, you simply do what it takes to save her. So with wit and with courage and with faith, the woman responds to this riddle of Jesus. And she carries his analogy even further. And she says, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the crumbs from the children. She catches the meaning of the riddle. She recognizes that the children in the parable represent Israel, and the dogs represent the Gentiles. She understands and accepts the implications that Israel has priority over the Gentiles. She knew that Jesus was implying that his ministry was to the people of Israel, and that outreach to the Gentiles would come later, just as the family eats at the table and then after the meal gives the scraps to the puppy under the table. She understands that she has no right to demand anything from Jesus, but she's not willing to take no for an answer. So she says to him in this, by what she says, she is saying, Lord, I understand that I have no right to dine at the table, but I'm not looking for a full course meal. All I'm asking for is a few of the crumbs that the dogs would eat when they fall on the floor during the meal. And she actually uses a play on words here. Jesus talked about little dogs or, or little puppies. And she says, all I want are little crumbs, just children's crumbs. She knows, Jesus, I can't insist on your mercy, but I will take whatever you can give me. Boy, that's not entitlement, is it? Do we ever find in our culture today an attitude of entitlement? You owe me. I deserve it. I demand my rights. But we should follow the example of this woman. When we come to Jesus, 
we come as beggars who would be pleased for even a crumb from the table of the master. Very often in the Bible, when people come before God, they identify themselves in very humble ways. David said in Psalm 22, I am a worm and no man. He was saying, I have no claim on your grace. Every crumb you give me is given out of your mercy. Isn't uh, we sing the hymn? Would he, what's the, my mind just went blank. At the cross, would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Now, that's the original wording. Some contemporary wording changes the word worm to one, for such a one as I. But the word worm is biblical. And it's, it's coming from an, an attitude of total humility before the Lord. Now, she doesn't cut herself off from Jesus by saying, well, I guess I don't deserve anything. See you later. No, that's not the proper kind of humility. She accepts the judgment of Jesus and pleads for his grace. Augustine said that it was pride that changed angels into devils. And the devil uses pride as a device, as the means to separate us from God, to separate us from God's help. We can convince ourselves, well, I can handle this situation on my own. I can handle the problem on my own. I don't, I don't need to really humble myself before God and call out to him like this woman. But it's this humbleness that brought healing. Jesus sees her attitude. He sees her faith. And the word there is mega faith, like a lot of faith. And he says to her, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she goes home and finds her daughter healed. You know, one of the theologicals, one of the things about the story that's theologically significant is that she found salvation through Israel. Israel in the Bible is theologically significant. God brings his, his promises of salvation through the nation and particularly through Jesus Christ, who was the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel. And God brings salvation to us through Jesus. In a sense, we're all dogs under the table. We have no right to demand anything from God. We don't deserve a seat at the table. All we can come, all we can do is come in faith and ask for some crumbs. And you know what God does? In his mercy and in his grace, he actually takes us out from under the table and gives us a seat at the table as part of his family. The question is, are you willing to humble yourself so that you can be, become part of God's family? And you might say, well, my sin is greater than you realize. And let me tell you, God's grace is greater than you realize. It's greater than any sin. Jesus is the Savior who cannot be hidden. The other story, after this, Jesus still stays in Gentile territory. He goes north. He kind of makes this horseshoe-looped route. He travels about 190 kilometers here. For those of you who are very old, that's 120 miles, okay? My, my dad, I have to put, my dad doesn't like kilometers. He's, he's old and he likes it in miles, so there. 190 kilometers, 120 miles. So he does this long trek as an extension of his ministry to people who are not Jewish. And as he's doing this, he goes into this town and some friends in this town bring to Jesus a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And Mark, desc Mark describes this very strongly. He had severe difficulty in speaking. Nobody could discern what he is saying. And it's interesting that when, before Jesus heals him, he actually takes him away from the crowd to deal with him on a personal level. He doesn't want the man just to become a spectacle. Jesus is not, he doesn't want a crowd. He's not like, you know, these healing shows where everything is so dramatic and, and, you know, done for the audience. Jesus wants to deal with him individually as a person. He signifies that he's a unique individual. 
Now, why does Jesus, you know, touch his eyes and spit and touch his tongue? Well, healing in the ancient world was a hands-on activity. You ever go to the doctor? Say, say you're sick today and you go to the doctor. You kind of have some expectations about what the doctor will do, right? He's going to get out his stethoscope. He's going to listen to your chest. He's going to say, might say, okay, let's, let's do some blood work. Let's, like there's some expectations about what you think might happen when you go to the doctor. Well, in the ancient world, heal, there, there was some expectation as to what healers would do. And so Jesus is probably doing things that other healers did to show the man to, to meet these expectations, but also to take it beyond that. People in the ancient world expected a healer to do some action that would bring about a restoration. So he places, Jesus places his fingers in the man's ears, and that meant, I'm going to remove the blockage in your hearing. He spits and touches the man's tongue, which meant, I'm going to remove the blockage in your mouth. And then notice Jesus looks up to heaven, which means it is God alone who can bring this healing. But you notice something else? Jesus looks up to heaven and he sighs. He sighs. That's an expression of his love and his compassion for the man. I think it's also an expression of his grief over the fall of man and the consequences of sin. It's the sigh of God over a broken creation. It's Jesus like, this is not the way things should be. You shouldn't be suffering like this. this the world is broken. And then Jesus says in Aramaic, be opened. And immediately his ears were open, his speech difficulty gone. He began to speak. The original Greek says the shackle of his tongue was released. Like a prisoner bound in chains, Jesus broke this captivity, this disability, and set him free. And in a sense, this is what happens to every person in salvation. We can't open our ears to God in our own strength. But... Through the word of God, the spirit opens our ears and allows us to hear the truth and to understand it. God sets us free through the power of the Holy Spirit. And even as a Christian, we can be spiritually deaf. Sometimes just life itself deafens us to what God wants to do in our lives. And that's why I think Jesus takes this man away from the crowd. And in a way, he's saying, sometimes you need to get away from the crowd. Get away from social media. Get away from what distracts you from hearing me. And the fact that Jesus restored this man's speech and his hearing is also a sign that Jesus is fully God. Because in, back in Exodus, God says, I'm the one who gives a person their speech or makes, or, and their sight and their hearing and so on. So Jesus proves that he is fully God when he does this. And because of that, he deserves praise. I don't know what the man said when he was healed, probably praising something, you know, happy that this happened. But Jesus did say, now don't tell anybody about this. And he did the exact opposite, went and told others. We can't condone his disobedience, but we certainly can understand his enthusiasm. And what, how Mark concludes this is significant. People were overwhelmed and said, he has done everything well. The word well echoes what God did in creation. Remember, in Genesis chapter 1, God separated light from darkness and created land and animals and people. And, and God, during, his, during creation, said... It is good. It is good. And the crowd is saying the same thing. This is good. This is good. He's reversing the curse. There was a Robert De Niro, the actor, once did a television interview. And the interviewer asked De Niro, at the end of your days, if you come before God, what will you say to him? And of course, if you've seen any of his, you know how cocky he can be, Right? And this is what De Niro said. He said, what I'm going to say to God is this. You've got some explaining to do. 
Now, whether he realizes it or not, he's the one that's going to do the explaining. God does not have to explain anything. He is the sovereign Lord over all things. And the testimony of God's people will be the testimony of this crowd. God does all things well or good. So, how do we live out these stories? Let me give you this. Oh, hold on here. And Jesus fulfills ancient prophecy, too, when he, uh, back from Isaiah, when he heals this man. But I want to jump to this. How do we live out these stories? First, look up like Jesus and pray. Make prayer a priority. If we want the spiritually blind to see, you have to look up. If we want our church to grow, we have to look up. That's where it begins. Look up. Second, sigh like Jesus. Share his compassion for a hurting world. Third, reach out like Jesus. Minister to others. Don't shy away from sin and pain. Love others, even though you, you grieve the sin that has trapped them, but love them. And then pronounce the good news. The look, the sigh, the touch, and the word. All of these things brought healing to this man. And that's how Jesus will minister through us to others. That's how we reach our world for Jesus. That's how healing comes to our homes and our neighborhood. Let's pray. God, thank you for these things. Thank you that you are the God who does all things well. You are the Savior who cannot be hidden. And boy, people tripped over Jesus. You were, you were scandalous. And you still are. We have to come to you like this woman, humble, knowing that we have nothing to bring. It's simply your grace that gives us a seat at the table. And like this man, only you can break the shackles that bind us. And in the end, we will truly say, you do all things well. It is good. You are reversing what is broken in this world. So, Lord, thank you for these truths. I pray this in your name. Amen.
how that first one you did right after the message just fit so well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to leave you with the words of another song. It's an old hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And in it, it says, Hear him, ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb, which means those with a speech impediment, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your maker come and leap, ye lame, for joy. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And that's the future. God, because, only because of God's grace. So blessings as you leave today. Amen.